This is the Gospel of the Lord. So good evening, everybody. It's a great privilege to be with you for the novena, and uh, I hope I'll be able to say something uh, that will resonate with you over the, 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 the next period of time. So I just want to begin with a little story. And uh, in the story, we have a family, a father and a mother, and their, their, their girl, who's not quite a child anymore, but she's still a young girl, and they go to a restaurant for a meal, and the waitress comes to the table, and the father od- orders his meal, and the wife too. And when it comes to the little girl, the waitress smiles down at her anyway, and she says, Honey, what would you like? And the little girl beams up, and she says, I'd love chicken nuggets and French fries and a milkshake. And the father immediately cuts across her. He says, No, she'll have soup, and she'll have the salad. So the waitress anyway is, is writing in the notebook. She goes, uh, just to make sure I got that right, it's uh, chicken nuggets and fries and a milkshake. And the little girl looked up in amazement. She goes, wow, she actually thinks I'm a person. And in my faith journey, that wow moment uh, was so important. It, it, it reminds me of lines that Pope Benedict once wrote. And he wrote in, in his first big letter, The letter was called God is Love, and he wrote the following. He said, we we Christians are people who have come to believe in God's love for us. He said, being a Christian is not about the right ideas in your head, and it's not about following some set of rules or commandments. He said, to be a Christian is the result of an event, of an encounter with a person that gives life a new horizon and a good solid direction. Uh, It's always a personal encounter. Now, in my um, life growing up, I grew up in a traditional Catholic family, and it's a way of life, I think, that's nearly extinct now. We prayed the rosary every night, uh, no work on a Sunday or fish on Fridays, saying our prayers at the bedside, uh, Mammy sprinkling us with holy water when we were going out to a hurler match, all those things. And, you know, it was great and it worked to an extent. It gave me a good base for my life anyway. Uh, but this traditional Catholicism, as, as, as I lived it anyway, it was very much rules-based. And you were either in or out, depending on what you did. You were either a good boy or a bad boy, uh, depending on, on whether you broke the rules. And I can remember one occasion, and I was at home, and I was being very cheeky and trying with my mother, and my mother's a great woman now, but messing in the kitchen, and didn't I, whatever messing, I banged my head. And I mem- remember my mother saying, God did that to you now for your boldness. And, and that was the thought I had about God. And there's some of the, maybe the younger people here who, when you think about Santa, or maybe the elf on the shelf, right, he sees you when you're good, but he also sees you when you're naughty, and he catches you out, and you'll be punished. And for me, that was God. It was very black and white. Now, I wasn't a rebel. I was always a bit of a coward. Uh, I was afraid of getting in trouble. Never uh, stayed out of school or anything like that. But when your teenage years hit and everything that goes with that, it's harder to stay on the right side of the line. And I think young people today, you know, they start to question what we do here and the ideas around church. And they, sometimes when you're, when you're a teenager, you fail to live up to the faith and you do things you shouldn't do. And then teenagers look around and they say, well, where can I see somebody who's living like this? Uh, a really good Christian person. They look at us priests maybe at times and they see us a bit dour and lacking in life. Or they look at church people and they say, well, God, some of them are hypocrites. And uh, they see maybe too much anger and brokenness in us. And they they say to themselves, this can't be true. Now, I never went that far myself when I was a teenager, but I was close enough to it. But what really shook me as as a teenager was one of my secondary school classmates. Uh, We weren't great friends, but we were friends, and my classmate died by suicide. And that was the thing that shook me when uh, when I was a teenager. And I struggled for years afterwards to make sense of how God, in in, in his world, how a lovely girl like her uh, could come to that. And it's fair to say the reason I ended up in seminary to start with was because when I looked at the world around, I said, you know, 
people need God, but it was just an idea in my head. I said, you know, without heaven, life doesn't make sense. It's like saying, what's the point in, in uh, if there's no end result? What's the point in all the study if there's no exam? What's the point in living this life if there's no end result? And if the options are very clear, you either pass or you fail, it's either heaven or hell. When then I'll become a priest and I'll teach people the rules and they'll stay on the right side of the line and get to heaven. That was my idea, to put it simply. So I went into the seminary with this in mind and I never had a real deep living encounter with God. It was all ideas or all rules. Now recently, there was an online video it was in a mass somewhere up in the north of Ireland. You might have seen it on uh, Facebook or one of these things. So it was a priest standing up here where I am, and he had the First Communion children all around him. And uh, he was talking to them about Jesus. And he said, you know, Jesus loves everybody in his lovely Northern Ireland accent. And the webcam didn't pick up, but one of the little boys at the front murmured something. And the priest started bursting out laughing. He said, you can't say that in the church. So apparently what the little boy had said was surely Jesus doesn't like rangers. Uh, and the priest jokingly replied, he said, well, Jesus loves almost everybody, he said. So what the, what the thing that made the difference for me was in seminary, I discovered the power of the word of God. Of course, I knew there was a Bible. We all know that. And I learned some of it in school, the parables and stories. But somewhere in my head, I had it, you know, Bible-believing Christians were the Protestants, right? And we Catholics had the sacraments, and that was enough for us. We didn't want to be Bible bashers. So I didn't really have much of a knowledge of the Bible or the Word of God. But when I got to seminary, all that changed. One professor in our classes, he said, what ye should do is read what Pope John Paul said to the seminarians when he came to Maynooth in 1979. So I went off and did that. And this is what he, what he said. He said, Dear seminarians, I would like to speak to you about the word of God because you are called to hear it and guard it and to live it. And Pope John Paul said to him, You should base your entire life on it. It should be the great treasure of your lives because if you do that, you'll have a deep knowledge of the mystery of Jesus. So I read that and I said, God, I don't know anything about the Word of God. I better start reading it. I made a, a, a radical daily commitment to pick up my Bible and open it and read and to think about what it was saying to me and really take it to heart. And I'm delighted Pope Francis said the same thing. He said, every Catholic should try and have a pocket New Testament. Keep it in your pocket or in your, the glove compartment of your care and take it out whenever you have a break and listen to what God has to say to you. See, I was always brought up to think prayer was what I said to God and what I was asking him for. And for the first time, I started listening to what he wanted to say to me. And that was when a relationship started to blossom. I was recognizing another voice, a personal voice and a personal address. Jesus always makes a personal address. I said, I'm actually getting to know who he really is through his own words. And then moving on, because uh, I remember another incident very well at that time in seminary. I found myself in a bit of hot water, I'd done something fairly serious that I shouldn't, and I was very much on the wrong side of the, the line with the rules, on the naughty list. And I was condemning myself. There was a voice in my head saying, you fool, you're a bad person. If anyone finds out about what you did, uh, they'll disown you. I was lucky enough because there was another angel on the other shoulder and at least I, I, I was lucky enough to listen to that. He said, well, what has God to say about this? And that time I was in the oratory of St. Mary's, the seminary chapel, a lovely oratory, and uh, I picked up my Bible and I opened uh, the story of the prodigal son. And this was a key moment in my life. In that story it says the tax collectors and the prostitutes were all seeking to hang out with Jesus and the religious people were complaining. And then Jesus tells this wonderful story. So I read how the prodigal son had done something awful, turned his back on his father and threw away all his inheritance. And uh, he ended up in a very bad state and longing for the husks of the pigs. 
Then I remembered what happened. He came to his senses. He listened to the, the good angel on his shoulder, you could say. And uh, when he was consumed with guilt, he decided to turn back. I'll go back to my father and I'll plead with him to take me back as a servant. So I took close note when I was reading how Jesus presents God to us. How God received this wayward son. There was no need for pleading and no need for groveling. He didn't have to come back on his knees even. It says, while that uh, young man was a long way off, the father saw him. And moved almost from the bowels with pity, it says. He ran, the father ran to him. He placed his head on his shoulder and he embraced him tenderly and said, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So much did he love the son, so happy to get him back. This wasn't the God that I grew up believing in who was waiting to catch you out. Uh, it sounds too good to be true nearly. But as I was reading this in the, in, the, in the chapel and Jesus was in the tabernacle guiding me, I felt overcome. And there was something like a warmth welling up inside me. And I actually, tears started forming in my eyes because I said, I've done something bad and God isn't going to kick me out the back door. And uh, that was a huge experience for me. That's what I call an event. A moment where God shows up as he really is. This tender, loving father. And um, I felt like that little girl in the restaurant. He actually sees me and he understands me. He knows my weaknesses, and there, there's a lot of them. You can ask my mother again if you want. Uh, he's not waiting for me to be perfect before we start to hang out together. What proves his love for us is that he died for us while we were still sinners. Nowhere in the gospel do we have an account of Jesus waiting for someone to repent of their sin before he engages them, before he forms that personal friendship with them. You have the sinner Zacchaeus. He never did anything. Jesus went straight to him. He was still a tax collector. He said, I'll eat at your house tonight. And Zacchaeus couldn't believe it. The Samaritan woman, she was on her sixth man. And Jesus sought her out. And he said, I have a gift for you. Living water. The prodigal son here today. Simon Peter who ran away from him. And Jesus still sought him out again. There's no prior demand. No high fence to jump. He says to Zacchaeus, I want to go to your house. So all their behavior changes, all their goodness grew out of his love for them. It was his acceptance of the sinner and of me as well that inspired the change of heart, not the other way around. So this grace, we call it divine mercy, God's free gift of forgiveness. Just coming to an end now, God has given each of us a blank check offered from Calvary, but we have to cash it in. It's a blank check is useless until we sign it and cash it in. And I honestly say that if I hadn't encountered that, with all the things that I've come across in my life, the sufferings, I don't think I'd have been able to cope without knowing that this is how God really is. No matter what circumstances life throws up, I have faith that God's mercy is ever greater. No matter what we can do to mess up, or no matter what good we can do, his mercy is always there. Our Father in heaven is so tender. He carries every person here in his heart with that tenderness. And you might say, if he knew what I did, but he knows. He knows and it's still there. And the worse the sinner, the more he loves them nearly. So he wants us to open our hearts and our own particular wounds to him. He, he has something tailor-made in his word for all of us. So in my prayer, and particularly in the silence of that prayer, I feel like at times now I'm tuning in a radio and I can get the presence of God coming through my heart, that seed of the words he spoke to me taking shape, even when I goof up, even when the circumstances are particularly difficult as they do in, in our priestly ministry from time to time. Just always keep my eyes fixed on the Jesus uh, and I know he loves me and I can feel this love for him in my heart as well. And like Simon Peter, as he was thinking, I know he's not going to let me go. So even if the wheels come off my wagon, he'll hold me. In stormy waters, he'll never let us sink into the waves.